Hello. In this video, we are going to derive the bending normal modes of vibration for sulfur hexafluoride using the Kim method. Recall that in part one, we had defined positions for the six fluorine atoms of sulfur hexafluoride, and each of those positions was at the center of the face of a cube. To represent the vectors for the bending motions, we look for the bisector for each uh, bond angle in the molecule. This works out to be, since the positions of the fluorine atoms are the centers of each of the faces, we have two different types of positions for the bending motions. For the top and bottom faces, the bending motions are going to be at the uh, midpoint of each of the edges. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the bending motions that will define using points at the center of the, the edge. Around the, the center, again, we have uh, at the midpoints of the edges, points one, two, three, four. So there are a total of 12 points that we have to define for the bending motions of sulfur hexafluoride. So we will put down what those points are. So E1, 1, 0, 1, B2, 0, 1, 1, B3, minus 1, 0, 1, B4, 0, minus 1. One. So notice that these are along the top face of the cube and gives points that are at the uh, midpoint of the edges. Along the bottom, it works the same sort of way. We have 1, 0, minus 1, B6, 0, 1, minus 1, B7, minus one, zero, minus one. And then B8, we have zero, minus one, minus one. And notice that once we had figured out the coordinates for points B1 through B4, B5 through B8, simply we took the same X and Y coordinates and transformed the Z coordinate from plus one to minus one. And the last four points we have are at the midpoints in the xy plane. So these have the particular coordinates 1, 1, 0, B10, we have minus 1, 1, 0, B11, minus 1, minus 1, 0, and then the last one is B12, which is 1, minus 1, 0. They have a z coordinate of zero because they are actually in the x, y plane. The first irreducible repression that we're going to uh, evaluate for sulfur hexafluoride is the triply degenerate T2G. And this has three different basis functions. The first basis function we're going to evaluate is xz. So again, we look at the x and z coordinates and we multiply them together to evaluate the basis function. So we notice for b1, 1 times 1 is 1, so it has a coordinate of 1. Notice for b2, since x is equal to 0, xz is also equal to 0. For b3, minus 1 times plus 1 is minus 1, so that gives a coordinate of minus 1. For B4, 0 times 1 is 0. For B5, we have 1 times minus 1. So again, the coordinate is minus 1. So we have minus B5. For B6, 0 times minus 1 is 0. B7, we have minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. So we have plus B7. For B8, 0 times minus 1 is 0. And similarly, notice for points B9 through B12, since it has a Z coordinate is equal to 0, that makes 
the basis function identically equal to zero for all four of those points. So the overall bending motion is B1 minus B3 minus B5 plus B7. So angles B1 and B7 get bigger, while B3 and B5 get smaller. Our second basis function is YZ. So again, we look at the Y and Z coordinates, we multiply them together, and that is, will end up being the coefficient for each of our particular vectors. So for B1, we have 0 times 1 is 0. For B2, we have 1 times 1. So that gives us a coordinate of 1. So the coefficient is 1 for B2. For B3, 0 times 1 is 0. For B4, we have minus 1 times plus 1. So the coefficient is going to be minus 1 for B4. For B5, we have 0 times minus 1 is 0. For B6, 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, so that's minus B6. For B7, 0 times minus 1 is 0. For B8, minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. So the coefficient for B8 is a plus 1. Similarly, because the Z coordinates are all equal to 0, YZ is going to be equal to 0 for B9 through B12. So the overall YZ bending motion is B2 minus B4 minus B6 plus B8. B2 and B8 get bigger as B4 and B6 get smaller. The third member of the T2G combination is XY. So we evaluate the X and Y coordinates, multiply them together, and that will give us the coefficient. Notice that for points B1 through B8, either X or Y is equal to zero. So the coefficients for B1 through B8 would be zero. Now, when we get to B9, we notice that X and Y are not both equal to zero. One times one is one, so we have plus B9. Minus one times plus one is minus one, so it's minus B10. For B11, minus one times minus one is plus one, so we have plus B11. And then for B12, one times minus one is minus one, so minus B12. So overall, this particular bending motion has B9 and B11 getting bigger, while B10 and B12 get smaller. And this is all three members of the T2G irreducible representation for the bending motions of sulfur hexafluoride. The next set of bending motions that we would like to derive are the T1U set, triply degenerate, which has three basis functions, X, Y, and Z. So let's start with X. Now recall that we actually had a T1U stretching motions as well. So um, here we see the case when we have the bending motions. And we notice that the basis function is X. So the coefficient for each of these vectors is simply going to be the value of the X coordinate for that particular point. So for B1, X is equal to one, so the coefficient is one. For B2, the X coordinate is zero, so it drops out. For B3, the value of X is minus one, so we have minus B3. For B4, X is equal to zero, so zero. B5, X is equal to plus one, so we have plus B5. B6 is equal to zero. B7, X is equal to minus one. So we have minus B7. For eight, X is equal to zero. For B9, X is equal to plus one. So we have plus B9. For B10, X is equal to minus one. So we have minus B10. For B11, x is equal to minus 1, so we have minus b11. And for b12, x is equal to plus 1, so the coefficient is a plus 1. So we have a complicated bending motion here, b1 minus b3 plus b5 minus b7 plus b9 minus b10 minus b11 plus b12. Now similarly, we can evaluate directly the set belonging to the basis function y. And again, so now we look through and write down the y 
coordinate as the coefficient. So b1, y is equal to 0, so there's no a term there. b2, y is equal to 1, so we have plus b2. And now I'll just kind of write down what we have. We notice for b4, we have a minus 1, so it's minus b4. For 6, we have plus 1, plus b6. b8, minus 1, so minus b8. For b9, plus 1, so plus b9. b10, again, plus 1, plus b10. And notice for b11 and b12, the coefficients are minus 1, because the coordinates are minus 1. So minus b11, minus b12. So once we have the coordinates, it's almost trivial to write down the expression for the bending motion if we know the basis function. Last but not least, the last basis function is z. So we notice for b1 through b4, the z coordinates are plus 1. So we have b1 plus b2 plus b3 plus b4. And similarly, for 5 through 8, the z coordinate is minus 1. So the coefficients are going to be negative. Minus b5, minus b6, minus b7, and minus b8. Last but not least, we notice that for b9 through b12, the z coordinates are equal to 0. So the coefficients in this particular uh, bending motion would also be 0. So this gives us all three members of the T1U irreducible representation for the bending motions of sulfur hexafluoride. The last set of bending motion that we are going to arrive belong to the T2U irreducible representation. So for this case, we have to use not linear or quadratic basis functions, but we actually have to use the cubic functions. So the first set we're going to use is x times z squared minus y squared. So this is the most complicated basis function we've had to do, evaluate so far, but it works the same way as the previous basis functions. At any particular point, we evaluate x, y, and z, and then we insert them into this particular basis function. Whatever the value of the function is at that point will be the coefficient for the point. So for b1, we notice that x is equal to 1, z is equal to 1. So 1 times 1 is 1, so the coefficient for b1 is going to be a plus 1. For b2, we notice right away that x is equal to 0. So because of the way this basis function is set up, if x is equal to 0, the basis function has to be 0. So any of the points where the x coordinate is equal to 0, we can stop with them right now. So the next point where x is not equal to 0, we have for b3. So b3, we see that x is equal to minus 1. z squared is 1. So that gives us a coefficient of minus 1. So we have minus b3. Next for b5, the x coordinate is plus 1. z is equal to 1, but z squared is positive 1. So that evaluates this basis function to be plus 1 at that point. So we have plus b5. b6, x is equal to 0, so we can omit it. b7, z is minus 1. z squared becomes plus 1. x is minus 1, so we have minus 1 times plus 1 is a minus 1. So we have minus b7. b8, since x is equal to 0, we can omit that one. So now we notice for b9, x is equal to 1 z is equal to 0, and y is equal to plus 1. So that gives us a 1 times a minus 1 for b9. So this is minus b9. For 10, the minus y part gives us a minus 1. x is minus 1. So overall, this function becomes a positive 1. So we have plus b10. Similarly for b11, x, uh, y is equal to minus 1, but when we square we get a plus 1, minus 1 in front, minus 1 for x, we have minus 1 times minus 1, gives us plus 1, so we have plus b11. And our last point, for b12 we have y is equal to minus 1, 
the square gets a plus one. The minus one in front makes it minus. X is positive, so plus one times minus one is a minus one. So we have minus B12. So that gives us the first of the bending motions for T2U. Our next basis function that we're going to look at is Y times Z squared minus X squared. And again, we do the same uh, procedure that we did for the first basis function. Again, we note that if Y is equal to zero, the entire basis function is going to be equal to zero. So we can immediately omit any of the points where the Y coordinate is equal to zero. And you can write down what this is going to be. So we have B2 minus B4 plus B6 minus B8 minus B9 minus B10 plus B11 plus B12. And then last but not least, the last basis function is z, x squared minus y squared. So right away, we know that any of the points where the z coordinate is equal to zero would make the basis function identically equal to zero. So the coefficients would be zero, and we can omit them from our bending motion. The points that do have particular value, so we notice for b1, x is equal to plus 1, z is equal to plus 1. So we have 1 times 1 is 1, so b1 is the coefficient. For b2, we notice that z is equal to 1. Now we have y is positive 1. When we square it but then take the negative, this becomes a minus 1. 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, so we have minus b2. And I'll continue to write down the rest of these. We work the same way. We have plus b3, minus b4 minus B5, plus B6, minus B7, plus B8. And this gives us all three of the T2U uh, bending motions for sulfur hexafluoride. Now we have an important question. Did we find all the normal modes of vibration for sulfur hexafluoride? Or recall that there are 3n minus 6 normal modes of vibration for a nonlinear molecule, and sulfur hexafluoride is nonlinear. We note that n is equal to 7 because there's 7 atoms in sulfur hexafluoride. So that means that we should have 15 vibrations, 15 normal modes of vibration for sulfur hexafluoride. Did we actually find that many vibrations? Well, notice that for the stretches, so let's kind of write this as gamma stretches, that we're able to find an A1G stretch. We're able to find two EGs, and we're also able to find three T1Us. So that gives us a total of six of the stretches. For the bending motions, we found T2G, so that's three there, plus T1U, plus T2U, which is nine. So if we add these together, we get all 15 of the normal modes of vibration for sulfur hexafluoride. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.